Chasing Leviathan is a podcast about pursuing truth, one big question at a time through the discipline of listening. Truth is too big to tame. But if we pay close attention, we might get the chance to glimpse something truly magnificent. So please join me in this pursuit, one week at a time. Hello and welcome to Chasing Leviathan. I'm your host, PJ Weary, and I'm here today with Dr. David Wills, Professor of French and Francophone Studies at Brown University. Uh, We're here today to talk about his translation work with Perjury and Pardon, uh, lectures by Derrida, seminars that he gave uh, in the 90s. Uh, Dr. Wills, wonderful to have you on today. Uh, Happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Now, I see you've translated a lot of Derrida's work uh, why Perjury and Pardon next? Why? What made you choose this two-volume translation set? Okay, I, the answer to that is pretty simple. I didn't choose it, it cho- chose me, because um, there's a team of nine people, uh, officially at the moment, who are working systematically through the seminars of Derrida's teaching career, um, of which there are 43 years. Uh, so you can imagine one volume per year. Uh, there's a lot to work with. And when the decision was made to, uh, to publish the seminars, made in conjunction with uh, Derrida's heirs, heirs after he died, uh, he died in 2004, uh, having said that he really didn't want the seminars uh, published as, as is, uh, but his his wife and uh, children uh, understood that there were tape recordings of the lectures and so on, and that sooner or later it would probably find its way to the web in one form or another, and that it was better to undertake something uh, uh, organized. Uh, so uh, once that decision was made, and once the French publisher, which was additionally uh, originally Edition Galilée and is now Edition du Seuil, which is a more uh, uh, broad spectrum uh, publisher. Uh, When that decision was made, we decided to start from the end and work backwards. Hmm. Uh, Mostly because uh, the closer to the end of his life, at least, uh, the work existed on hard disk that could be accessed easily. Uh, and there were manuscript versions easy to do, to find. And so we decided to work back from his last year of seminars, which was uh, in 2003. Uh, and we've worked to Perjury and Pardon, which comes from 1997 to 1999. And other colleagues had been working on the previous volumes, and I had done a small volume because that uh, backwards progression has been respected uh, generally speaking, but there have been a couple of volumes published from earlier years, uh, one handwritten one um, and one in uh, TypeScript. Uh, so those, the, that work has to be, you know, gone back to and, and there's a certain amount of editorial uh, labor invi- involved in that, which is not the case for the, the ones from the 90s uh, on when he was typing on a, on a computer. So uh, it, was, it, it came to be my turn. And uh, I signed up to do these two volumes. Um, and so here we are. So this in the series, working backwards, uh, Perjury and Pardon 1 and Perjury and Pardon 2, uh, the volumes 5 and 6 of, of, of the backwards chronological series, um, but which will go back to 1991-92 because it's at that point that he began uh, a whole uh, group of questions and investigating a whole group of questions that he included within the uh, the broad title of questions of responsibility. So in fact, that covered the whole work he did 
uh, beginning in 91 and going for 12 years uh, until uh, 2003. So just to quickly mention the other uh, volumes, so 91, 92 uh, is on secrecy or the secret. Uh, after that, there's a series of three volumes on witnessing. He, he morphs from the secret into witnessing in general. Uh, then hospitality, and those two volumes are already in, have been translated and are in, uh, in press now by uh, translations by colleagues of mine. Then perjury and pardon, then the death penalty, then the beast and the sovereign. So that, that's the order of, of, uh, of subjects uh, under which, as I say, he, he uh, included, uh, which he included under the general umbrella of questions of responsibility. As you undertake this work, um, just to give us kind of the lay of the land, what are some common misconceptions uh, or mistakes people make about translating? Well, let me speak in, in, the, in the case of Derrida's work, because that's really uh, what I've translated. I've translated a couple of things, uh, something by Jean-Luc Narcy and a couple, of, a couple of other philosophers, but generally speaking, my, my translation work is limited to the work of Derrida. Um, I think what is the, the problem for some translations, uh, some of the earlier translations of Derrida's work, uh, is that they weren't uh, undertaken by people with an ear for the extent to which he's using uh, idiomatic uh, colloquial language. So one has to have a good knowledge of French from at that register in that register at that level um, not just a literary French uh, not just uh, word for word and and as uh, as you mentioned when we were talking just before we, we began with Derrida there's also a certain amount of work on I'll say work and play with the language itself <laughs> right um, yes and and of course you, you know many many translators will pick up on a certain amount of that uh but there is also a level at which uh Derrida is is speaking in everyday French and and working with everyday idiomatic French uh and 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 working with the question of translation and he, there are often it's probably not not a single seminar where the question of translation doesn't come up uh, and you know he's he's famous for for uh, using precisely idioms that that are impossible to translate in order to further his idea that translation is necessary and impossible, right? Right. Uh, or or possible at the same time as as impossible. You know, there's no way that that one can just transliterate word for word all the time. I mean, one can up to a certain extent, but, but that extent is limited. Um, and therefore, uh, as I say, one has to have a good sense of the language, as it were, from the inside. I mean, I'm not a bilingual speaker. I mean, I'm a, I've, learned, I've learned French. I didn't grow up speaking French. Um, but uh, most of those of us who are involved in the translating of the seminars at this point are people who have studied French extensively. There are a couple of um, Francophone native speakers uh, in the group. Um, uh, so that sort of sense is necessary. But then one also has to, to work with and struggle with precisely these, these idiomatic terms that, that Derrida uh, you know, uses and works with in order to, in order to uh, you know, poeticize philosophy in a sense, uh, in order to say that, uh, in order, so that if, if one is to, to develop a problem in all its com complexity, one is, has to wrestle with language, right? And that one has a right, therefore, both to uh, spell out things extensively, page after page after page, but one also has the right to introduce short shortcuts, short circuits, right? Uh, and just to give an example from this, from this volume, uh, from Perjury and Pardon, there is a, a, uh, one of the seminars which he begins with saying, y'a pas de mal, 
which is already a contraction of the expression il n'y a pas de mal, uh, which is something you say when, uh, or some, something that somebody responds to you when you say sorry, you bump into them and you say sorry, and they say no, no, no problem. Uh, and uh, il n'y a pas de mal is something that he wants to uh, use in order to introduce the the question of uh, the difference between saying sorry and making an excuse uh, and the extent to which saying sorry can be something trivial but it can be also massive uh, when it comes to asking forgiveness for uh, the unforgivable um, which uh, involves normally uh, evil acts, right? And the word mal is le mal means uh, evil, right? Uh, or it, it, it doesn't only mean evil, it can just mean wrong, but it can, uh, it, it does, does literally mean uh, evil. So, so he's using that as, as I say, as a, as a condensation of various ideas that he wants to develop. So, so what, what does the translator do with that? Il uh, a pas de mal. Um, my solution in this case was to say no harm done, uh, which is obviously not a word for, word for word translation. It doesn't have the word evil in it, um, but it does have the word harm, right? So it does suggest that uh, you could have been doing something terrible to me, uh, for which you really need to apologize, as it were, uh, for which you really need my forgiveness, right? Because that's more of the question. Um, or it could have been something trivial. So, so one has to come up with those, those sorts of solutions. Yeah. And I'm looking at it and, uh, obviously I think when you say like, if you'd said no evil done, that would have been a weird English phrase, right? Like it would have been original. Uh, right. but if you say no harm done, what, what's important to you to capture, because what seems to be important to, uh, Derrida is the colloquial f nature of what he's saying. Precisely, precisely, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, a, a, I mean, this is a common enough example. I think that there would be very few translators who wouldn't, wouldn't understand the, uh, you know, the idiom, idiom, the, the idiom of it, but, um, but precisely, uh, you, can't, you can't transliterate right. in that case. Right, right. And so, and so you're going to lose something, right? No harm done is not the same as no evil done, right? It doesn't get, get that, that whole sense. So, so you are necessarily making that choice, those choices. And I, and I guess, um, you know, I, I often say to myself, as do um, colleagues, uh, that um, translation is not something we, ch we choose to do. Most of us are doing other work uh, in our own fields uh, on uh, as, as well. Um, I, I can't say that if somebody had come to me and said, you know, you're going to spend however much of, of my career I've spent in terms of translating what 20, 30% or something in terms of the, the output, uh, I would have probably said, no, I don't think so. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, there's a certain, there's a certain, uh, mechanical, element to it uh, is something you can pick up and put down, unlike uh, work of your own that requires developing a whole uh, th and, and thinking that, that, that requires concentration and can't be interrupted. Uh, with translation, you can pick it up and put it down. Obviously, you have to get yourself back in the swing of it, but uh, uh, it's, it's mechanical in that sense, um, doesn't require the same sort of intellectual commitment, I would say. I mean, it requires knowing the ideas, uh, knowing Derrida's ideas and, and, and being attuned to when he is precisely trying to condense something, uh, ideas that are developed in a much more uh, straightforward manner in other places and so on. It's, and, and then there's some pleasure in, in finding a, a good solution, of course. Um, that is closer to, I think, what literary translators, uh, the level at which they, they work uh, much of the time, right? Um, because you mentioned it, I did want to ask you uh, your own major work, um, Prosthesis, Dorsality, and Animation. 
uh, three volumes published in the Post Humanity series. Um, you know, I, I would love for you to just mention uh, what your own work is on, but also what is uh, what is meant by Post Humanities there? Right. Well, that's a, a title that um, that uh, the the editor of the series, uh, Carrie Wolf, came up with um, at at the University of Minnesota. Um, I guess it was. <clears throat> on the one hand, to uh, refer to, uh, once again in shorthand, refer to a, a variety of post this or that, post modernism, post structuralism, and so on, that, that was around at the time. This We're talking 20 years ago now, I think, when the series began, um, at least. Yeah, about that. Um, so it was that, and it was also to put it in the context of. Uh, a certain questioning of what constitutes the human that started to be uh, in vogue, uh, if you like, uh, around the same time. So questions about uh, relations between the human and the animal, uh, which Wolf's own work uh, deals with. Uh, uh, questions of uh, the humanism's response to uh, the grand questions of the 20th century and 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 the and the awful events of the 20th century the extent to which uh, the humanist response was able to was adequate to those um, monstrous things if you like uh, and so on and then the extent the the, the idea of uh, of um, what comes after the human or how the human gets uh, extrapolated, how the human gets prosthetized, as I would say, um, and, and, and is in a relation necessarily with the non-human or the inanimate. The animate is necessarily in a relation uh, with the inanimate from the start. I, w I would argue that, uh, uh, I, would, I would argue, for example, that um, that, that the fetus in the womb is uh, responding to an otherness that is totally other in the same way as when it comes out of the womb and it has to deal with the inanimate uh, world uh, that is faced with. Um, that it's, the, the, f there's, there's no point at which uh, the human is not dealing with its others, um, other humans, of course, other animals, of course, but to, to a huge extent, uh, other inanimate objects, right? As soon as we put on clothes, as soon as we put on spectacles, we are prosthetizing ourselves. Uh, you with your headphones uh, right yes. now, and your and your microphone, and 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 I with my computer and laptop and so on. So so you know we're always in that sort of relationship that is uh, uh, adjacent to the human. Uh, in the context of the human, but non-human, and so on. So, so uh, some of those ideas were uh, behind the choice of that uh, that uh, name for the series. As far as I know, um, I personally didn't have a, anything to do with that uh, that choice. But <laughs> but the work that I've done, it's true, um, all raises the question of how the human negotiates its relations with uh, the non-human, in particular, the in inanimate world, how, how our bodies uh, um, increasingly, right, uh, uh, are uh, interacting with, but interacting to the point of um, internalizing pretty much. And now with the development of technology that becomes more and more obvious, right? Chips in the brain, uh, uh, pacemakers right. in the heart, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, uh, the model, my model for prosthesis was, um, was a, a wooden leg. My father actually was an amputee. Uh, and so uh, he, we called it a wooden leg. Of course, it wasn't wooden. Um, but it was that sort of rudimentary uh, prosthesis that, was supposedly fulfilling the simple uh, 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 absence of a c capability, a disability, we would say, on the part of the human, right? Um, and to me, uh, and this it became autobiographical in a sense, and, and that's a question that gets raised in that first volume, um, 
I, I do tell the story of how in, in the family, that wooden leg uh, repre represented far more and many other things that had nothing to do with its simple replacement of the leg that had been amputated. Um, and, it, and it was something around which uh, all our family relations turned in a way. And I would even say that, that my relation to my father worked through the wooden leg uh, not that I didn't have human relations with right. him, but that there was never a moment when the fact that uh, he had this disability um, did not enter into our relations, whether the leg was on or off, right? Right. Uh, it was a fundamental part of his identity and a part of any kind of story he constructed. Right. And since you've used the word identity, an important uh, element of that is the fact that it's a fa fundamental part of his identity, which is completely alien to him as a human, as it were. Right. So it, it, it also fragments or, 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 or ruptures his identity in a sense. Right. So that he was he was a father who was whole to me. Uh, but he was also a father who was, had a disability and he was also a, a father who was part flesh and part steel. Uh, there was no getting around that. So he didn't have a simple identity in that sense. Uh, and, you know, I would say that all of us, uh, to the extent that we are prosthetized, um, uh, are dealing with that type of fragmented or fractured identity. Yeah, I, I even as you walk through this, I can see uh, why you <laughs> you ended up doing so much work with Derrida, right? Your your approach and even the way you use your language uh, is very reminiscent. Maybe, yeah, I, I guess. <laughs> um, but definitely, definitely, the idea of prosthesis is developed in his work, uh, you know, extensively, and uh, and and time and time again in places where he he tries to deconstruct, if I can use that word, since, since it gets used in relation to his work, um, where he tries to deconstruct the human or relations between the human and its others. Um, he says that it's not just about a relation of one human to another or relation of the human to the non-human animal, um, but he's always saying that the uh, the inanimate other um, is part of the equation, and the, and that the human uh, he would be the first to to argue that the the, the human is technologized uh, um, originarily from the beginning, if you like, uh, in in different ways. Uh, if you don't mind uh, me transitioning back to um, perjury and pardon. Um, and thank you for uh, that was a little bit off topic, but it was just really uh, digging in a little bit into your biography. Not you know, not crazy deep, but that was just that was. Uh, I wanted to ask about that. That was fascinating. Um, can you talk a little bit about how Derrida approaches the idea of forgiveness? I mean, I mean the the, the outside hypothesis, if you like, uh, uh, that that is followed through. Uh, in, in the work uh, is the idea that uh, one can only forgive the unforgivable, right? He says at a certain point, I wrote it down for us, there is forgiveness, if there is such a thing, only of the unforgivable. So what does he, what does he mean by that? He means that um, the trivial things that we say sorry for, right? Pardon me. Yes. Right. And he's no harm he, done. He opens. Yeah. <laughs> right. He opens. He opens the whole seminar with uh, saying "pardon" in French, which means "sorry," um, but which is in essence saying "forgive me." Right. Um, the trivial things where that is working uh, are trivial, right, and can be forgiven, right. So as soon as I say, sorry, you say no harm done, right? I bump into you, I, I say, sorry, you say no harm done. That's forgivable. He, he says, if there's any real forgiveness, right? It has to go much further than that. 
it has to go all the way to those things that we consider to be unforgivable. And the first example he takes in, in the first session of the, of the first year of volume one uh, is uh, a book by the uh, philosopher Vladimir Yankelevich, um, who wrote a book on forgiveness, right? And he was writing it against the background of the Holocaust, right? So there would be an example, right? How, 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 can, one, how can one forgive the Nazis for the Holocaust? One can't, in a sense, right? Uh, on the other hand, uh, if there is anything, uh, you know, if there is a forgiveness that really is forgiveness in the strong, strong sense of the word, it would have to be up to the task of forgiving the unforgiv unforgivable. And, you know, he works from that through various things such as um, in French, there is, and, and in most uh, countries that have ad adopted uh, human rights law in relation to crimes against humanity, um, there is, in France in particular, there is a law that says there's no statute of limitations uh, for a crime against humanity. They use the word imprescriptible, the imprescriptible, meaning to say that it's not anything that can ever be written off. Right. So, uh, you know, if, if, if Hitler were uh, alive today uh, uh, or any of those uh, Nazi figures that were condemned uh, at, at, at Nuremberg, if, if, if those people uh, were around uh, 50 years later, 75 years later, however much later it were, it, it happened to be, they would still be under French law, they would still be liable to be tried for the crimes they had committed. So, so there is a sense in which uh, the law is saying this is unforgivable, right? But that is, of course, in tension, in, in, in tension with uh, uh, the way that forgiveness functions a culturally, from trivial cases all the way to more serious cases, politically, uh, from smaller things all the way through. And another example he refers to is the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa uh, following the end of apartheid. Um, it's in, in, uh, in tension with, I've lost the uh, beginning of my sentence now. Um, oh, you were talking about... Uh where he uh, actually this might be a good place to, to kind of go he in the second volume he talks about um the political dimensions in the first volume he talks about the tri how the current accounts of forgiveness according to most traditions uh fail at providing a good accounting of forgiveness um so he gives like biblical accounts kant kierkegaard shakespeare yeah, right. um why right, that was think, the point i was going to make yes <laughs> Not only, not only cultural not, but, uh, or political, but also religious, in particular, religious uh, conceptions of forgiveness, right? Religious conceptions of forgiveness, for example, Christian grace, right, is supposed to be an absolute form of forgiveness, right? Uh, humans are supposed to be forgivable by God uh, for everything. Right, no, you can you can do anything, but it doesn't uh, exclude you from uh, Christian forgiveness, for example. Um, so he puts that into contrast with how uh, the same notion supposedly worked in in uh, ancient Greek uh, thinking, uh, where they have uh, sinome, uh, which gets translated often closer to indulgence uh, than forgiveness. Uh, in the in the Judaic tradition, uh, in the Quranic tradition, to some extent, um, he wants to say that that all of these uh, are dealing with it differently. Um, so that uh, there, the idea of of the unforgivable uh, is that it is forgivable, right? In 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 certain cases, for example, uh, in in Christianity. Um, so uh, 
that is intention precisely with a law of uh, no statute of lim limitations, right? Which seems not to not to allow for for forgiveness. To give a, a real example, you're talking about um, uh, if Hitler were alive today. Uh, a real example of this statute of limitations question. I was talking to Dr. Lewis Gordon. Uh, probably a year ago now, and one of the things that's come up is there's no statute of limitations on murder, and we literally have uh, in you know in the United States we have a history of lynchings, especially in the 50s, and we people proudly posed for newspaper photos with their names attached, and we know who those people are, and they're they're still alive. We know who these people are, and so that I mean. This is a, a very live question. It's, you know, um, I like I like the example of Hitler as, as a hypothetical. But, you know, when you because in some ways it, it's almost too close to home when you think about these very um, living and real examples of, of how statute of limitations can play out. The examples that he concentrates on in that second volume are precisely the uh, in, in terms of contemporary examples. Uh, are the um, uh, South African example, yeah. right, where apartheid comes to an end, there have been all these crimes committed, um, but the country wants to move on, right? Right. Uh, and so they put together this commission where all the victims have the right to say what they uh, ex experienced, um, and shocking things, right, and, 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 and the relatives of the victims uh, are able to um, ask for apologies and so on and so forth and face their face their victimizers and, and uh, you know that was a uh, a an important uh, and and cathartic uh, experience for that country um, uh, at at the end of that uh, period of apartheid so that that example he uh, he uh, concentrates on and then the other one which I guess alongside that seems trivial, uh, but it was contemporary at the time, at the end of the 90s, was the impeachment of Clinton. Um, because there's, there's, a moment, there's a moment when Clinton says, I'm sorry, when he, he, he goes before the television cameras. Uh, I can't remember exactly what moment it was um, in the impeachment process, but uh, where he said, uh, you know, I've done things um, and I'm sorry. I've, 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 done, I've, I've caused harm, right? Uh, he doesn't say I've lied um, because he was still faced with the perjury charge, right? Um, but he says, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, Derrida was uh, fascinated by um, how this works, was working in the American political context, right? Uh, and in relation to uh, uh, Clinton's uh, potential or real uh, uh, legal liability, um, but also just in relation to uh, the political situation and the cultural situation and, and how the Republican Party was, uh, was using this uh, against the Democratic Party, just as the uh, Republicans would reproach the Democrats for doing the same uh, in impeaching Trump, right? It's a, it's a political process. There's no getting away from it. Um, but he he was fascinated in it, fascinated in that in its American context, but also in what he saw as this global flourishing, as it were, of scenes of uh, forgiveness or scenes of asking for forgiveness. Uh, and the the Pope, for example, um, didn't say sorry for the Inquisition, but introduced something uh, that nevertheless. Uh, suggested a type of uh, uh, saying sorry. Um, uh, uh, Picasso's Guernica got restored to, to Spain and there was uh, a type of uh, reparation that was made in that case. So the, the word reparation comes up, of course, in this context. Um, Various various political figures uh, at at that time, and I think it still goes on. I, I was um, this could be a, a a humorous aside for later, perhaps. But it, there are there are uh, he he was fascinated by the idea that um, suddenly everybody's saying sorry 
in uh, these political situations, but measuring how sorry they are um, in relation precisely to uh, what they might then be asked to perform in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, penitence, uh, uh, reparation, and so on and so forth, right? So it's, it's, a, uh, it's a guarded uh, sorry. So is that, is that a situation of forgiveness that's going on there? And how does, uh, I mean, it's interesting that you bring up um, Clinton not saying sorry for lying. How does lying uh, as a thread kind of tie into this whole discussion? How does Dare to Use lying to kind of work within this framework of forgiveness? Um, because he sees uh, perjury, right? Uh, and in the American context in particular, uh, the, the functioning of perjury and the emphasis that's placed on perjury uh, in the legal system and, and how the uh, sanctions against perjury um, uh, are, are strong, right? Um, and, and can lead to, to all sorts of other uh, liabilities such as obstruction of justice and so on and so forth, right? Um, perjury is a big thing. So... He sees, sees it as being um, important in that uh, contemporary cultural context. But also, once one looks at Augustine, once one looks at uh, Rousseau, uh, both of whom uh, wrote confessions, right? Uh, he, he's, he wants uh, the idea of the lie to be something of a paradigm for fault in general. Right, that not because there's any comparison between simple comparison between lying and committing a massacre, right? But that there is a type of structural uh, continuity, uh, which means that the basic harm, the basic wrong, uh, can be uh, can be uh, understood within the idea of of perjuring yourself, making yourself uh, into something that you tell yourself you're not, right? You're lying to yourself. You have to lie to yourself in order to lie to somebody else, right? And if you're lying to yourself, you're making yourself other than you are, and therefore making yourself capable of being a criminal in the final analysis, right? And all the way to uh, performing something, something uh, unmentionable, unforgivable. So um, he, sees, he sees this uh, sort of balance between uh, the lie and, and, uh, and the forgiveness. You know, he would, he would look at biblical examples, um, you, you know, the, uh, uh, the expulsion from the, the Garden of Eden, the, 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 the flood uh, where, where God went back on his own word, Right, and said said sorry to humanity. I won't do this again. Right, um, I, 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 a very interesting uh, uh, mechanism. Right, very interesting uh, thing going on there, where where God, in a sense, says I lied. Right, um, God, in a sense, says I, sh I, sh I shouldn't have done that. I was at fault. Um, I didn't lie in a simple sense, but I, I unleashed. Um, I, I let myself get angry, angry enough to unleash this, this flood. Um, let's have a new covenant where I say, I won't do this again. So it's as if the, the new covenant, right, was a reparation for a fault, which was a type of lie. Because when, when one signs a new contract, right, uh, that's, a, that's a contract where one is uh, pledging to be truthful to that contract. So in the case of God, one could say that the implication is that in the first covenant, he wasn't truthful to it, right? He, 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 broke, he broke the contract in the sense of a perjury, a perjuring of himself in that sense. Um, Interesting. I mean, the, the word in French, parjure, uh, refers both to the event, the lie itself, uh, and to the person who, uh, who, who tells the lie, who does the lie. 
So un parjure is a, is a liar, a perjurer, um, and le parjure is the liar itself. Uh, and he, he uh, plays with that um, ambiguity in the final chapters of the, of the second volume. The, so even as we're talking about this, um, why can uh, forgiveness not be reduced to just repentance and punishment? Why does he, why does he need perjury? Do you mind expanding on that a little bit more? Maybe more in terms of like, why can't it be forgiveness in this? Why does it have to be the the lie? Why is it the inauthentic? Inauth- uh, I could say inauthenticity okay. <laughs> uh, that yeah. is the real problem. Okay, well, it's for those, uh, if you like, thematic reasons that I just uh, outlined, yes. right? That there's a way in which one can say that the, the the basic harm is a type of lie. Yes, I understand. Uh, yes, I'm tracking with that. So why can't it be the other explanations? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, the other explanation is is in terms of the work that he wants the title to do, um, where he, in on the one hand, pardon uh, is uh, forgiveness, but it also has the word don or gift in it. So just as that's why it translates literally into transliterates into English as forgive, right? Pardon, ah. forgive, and uh, and and perjury. We have the old word in English for swear. Um, when you forswear, it means when you go back on your oath. Uh, so we so we do have these, and he wants um, the idea of of the gift to be something of a. Uh, a paradigm case for what he often calls the aporia of uh, of ethical situations, where you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't. It, 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 there's no there's there's no way that you can there's no way that I can just give you something without expecting something in return, even if I want to. And there's no way that you can receive a gift from me without having some idea that you owe me something, right? So the, if, if the, the idea of uh, a gift would have to be something that totally exceeds any economic exchange. Um, so he's studied in other, in other situations uh, how, that, how that functions. Um, so I think he wanted to keep that as, uh, as I say, the umbrella term, the giving, how to give, giving freely, uh, to what extent that is possible, uh, how to give without indebting uh, the other person, without the person, other person necessarily feeling they're indebted, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think there's a, there's a strong sense in which outside of those uh, thematic concerns uh, that I mentioned, he, he sees a parallelism uh, of, of giving, forgiving, and swearing for swearing um, that he wants to resonate uh, here. Yeah, uh, thank you. That's a great answer to what was admittedly uh, kind of um, poorly worded question. So, so appreciate that. Uh, even as you talk about the aporias, it reminds me uh, all the way at the back, uh, at the beginning of our conversation when we were talking about translation, right? Uh, this is kind of the thing that fascinates Derrida is that we have to try and translate. We have to try and forgive, but it's impossible, right? And that's even the start of this, that one only ever asks forgiveness for what is unforgivable. Um, and in a lot of ways, you know, uh, 15 years ago when I was first starting to read Derrida, and I was uh, trying to understand him, you start to understand he's an Algerian Jew. He's trying to process the Holocaust. You know, you see uh, his talks with Labarth and Gadamer as they're talking about their heritage from uh, from Heidegger. Um, when we talk about the unforgivable, uh, I and and I don't want to oversimplify because that's really dangerous to Derrida. But th- this idea that um, we're all we've all been taught the Holocaust in. Uh, in history class, right? Yeah, you know, we all or in the news, and we saw 
Uh, we've seen the videos of the bodies being pushed with bulldozers, and it's overwhelming, right? It's you, we can't even begin to uh, fully grasp that, right? We we say words like six million, and we don't. That that's it's really not comprehensible, right? It, it, when we talk about numbers that big, and so if we can't even comprehend the evil, how can we forgive it? Is that kind of uh, th- is is that a good another way of saying what Derrida is saying? Yeah, I mean, I don't know to what extent he would consider these things to be quantifiable, right? Um, and as you just suggested, uh, you know, six million means something, but also means something impossible to con- to to comprehend, right? Um, but I think in terms of how uh, perjury and pardon function, uh, as we said at the beginning, it goes all the way from this, the tri- most trivial uh, t- to the most horrendous. Um, so, so along that scale, right, uh, we, we wrestle uh, all the time with, uh, with trying to quantify and to say, how bad is this? Right. right. How bad is this? And so what's the punishment? And we want the punishment to fit the crime, right? So, so we have that sense of, of there being a, a, a way of quantifying. Um, but in the final analysis, um, it's, it's, it's something that I think he would uh, shy away from trying to, uh, uh, presuming to be able to conceptualize in a systematic way. Um, I mean, he he takes, for example, the the uh, what the outrageous uh, case of uh, the Merchant of Venice and the pound of flesh, right? That 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 Shylock is required to give um, in order to pay his debt, um, and it's it's there where he brings into play in a very explicit sense. Um, the 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 extent to which the the Christian version of, uh, of forgiveness is in uh, tension with the Judaic version, and how the Christian version, in fact, in that in that particular case, um, is, is 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 pretending a certain superiority that allows it pr- to enslave, in the final in the final analysis, uh, the, the Jew in the in the picture. So um, so all the while when. Portia is giving this wonderful speech about the quality of mercy, right? And introducing uh, mercy, which is an, another word he uses a lot, um, because it means uh, it means grace, right? Uh, and it means something a gratuitous forgiveness it's in, in, its, in its best sense. Um, but it comes from uh, merces, the uh, Latin word for wages. So, so it's totally tied into an economic situation. Um, and, and thanks, <coughs> remerciement in French, all these words are, uh, function as economic words, even though they're supposed to, at the outside, be, uh, uh, be representing this gratuitous sense of grace. Of 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 of, uh, of giving once again. Here, that's where the giving comes comes back, right? Uh, of of giving gratuitously without expecting anything in return. Pure forgiveness, pure grace, which is precisely not what is an operation there. Right. And when 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 Portia gives this speech, uh, you know, it's it's tongue in cheek because she uses it. Uh, in order to gain it as, as, as a lawyer, because she's, she's dressed as a lawyer, in order to precisely win an argument uh, over Shylock and put him in a situation of totally losing everything, uh, even at the very moment where she's invoking this idea of grace or, or mercy. Earthly power, is like, earthly power is most like God when mercy seasons justice is is the uh, <laughs> that famous line that wasn't that wasn't the earth i'll give you the pure shakespeare earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice so justice itself so that would be the level at which there's an attempt to quantify right 
and have the, have the punishment fit the crime. Uh, an eye for an eye uh, at the outside, right? Right. Um, justice by itself is not enough, right? If we want to be godlike, we have to introduce mercy and, and Derrida loves the word seasons there. And he uses it in the culinary sense, right? When, when mercy spices up justice. Um, but it's more complicated because it's also the word that it gets translated into in the French version of Shakespeare is, is relevé, uh, which is the same word that is used for uh, Aufheben in uh, translations of Hegel uh, and uh, what, we call, what we translate as sublation these days. So there would be an overcoming, a replacement and an overcoming. So mercy would have to replace an overcoming come justice, right? If we are to have a justice system like close to God's, right? Um, so he's, he's playing, as I say, both with the sense of, of spicing up justice and of transcending justice. Um, Dr. Wills, I want to be uh, respectful of your time. Uh, Juan, thank you so much for coming on today. Um, besides buying your uh, excellent translation, um, which I, I think everyone should do, uh, what is one thing that you would leave uh, to our audience about uh, carefully reading Derrida and, or even perhaps about forgiveness? What's one thing that you would leave our audience thinking about this week? Well, first of all, the audience will have to forgive me. <laughs> uh, for uh, my failure to, uh, to express these ideas as well as I could have or might have. Um, and I say, that, I say that jokingly, but I also say it because it's, uh, it's something that, in, in another dimension that we didn't uh, get to that Derrida raises, which is the idea that, in fact, the operation of forgiveness is there in as soon as one opens one's mouth. Mm. As soon as one opens one's mouth, one is presuming that the other person is going to listen to what one says, whatever is going to come out of one's mouth, right? One requires that before one can even speak, right? I have to have a relationship of trust with you and vice versa, right? Otherwise, we can't speak at all, right? We can't, we can't say the slightest thing unless I trust that you are listening to me and prepared to listen to me and, and, and vice versa. So, so there's, a, there's a, a, a relationship of trust that is a way of saying, sorry for inconveniencing you, but uh, I'd like to say something. Yes, yes. So, so if, if one can think about that, uh, if one can think about the idea that uh, one is saying sorry whenever one speaks, um, it might bring the idea of forgiveness to the fore. But, but also, I guess, just uh, to, uh, to reinforce the, the, the importance of this work by Derrida, uh, both to bring into focus uh, situations that are everyday and situations that are massively um, impossible, seemingly impossible to deal with um, through these through these thematic uh, and the, through this philosophical thinking that that is far from um, uh, uh, you know removed uh, from uh, everyday ethical situations. Uh, so uh, you know that is also to answer your question about uh, about what to say to listeners about reading Derrida that. Yes, he's often considered to be to be difficult, um, and he's not like another philosopher that that you may have studied or read. Uh, but he's not uh, he is not um, trying to confuse you, right? He's not he's not willingly trying to confuse you. He's 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 asking you to think about these things that uh, we don't think about. Or, 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 or to, think, to think about them from a different point of view than, than the point of view from which we normally think about them. <laughs> and to realize to what extent, uh, you know, we are in these sorts of situations 
uh, in the, in situations of secrecy, mm. not just when we are Abraham about to sacrifice Isaac, um, but uh, but in everyday relations. Uh, we are in the relation of hospitality when we have to determine how much room we're going to give to a so-called guest. Uh, we're in situations of, um, of forgiveness, uh, as I say, from the moment we open our mouths, that, uh, that these are things worth thinking about because, uh, because they're the, the ethics of the everyday in many respects, but also they go all the way to these insoluble problems that we keep trying to face how to deal with terrible things that happen. Uh, Dr. Wills, uh, it's been a genuine pleasure talking to you today. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. I enjoyed talking to you too.